Taylor Strong. I'm one of the team members who worked on the uh, Farcaster um, Atomic Swap Protocol. And uh, I'm going to go through flavors of atomic swaps from, um, from zero to hero um, on chain logics in retrograde. Now, I got a lot of shit this morning, like when I gave this title to some who like reviewed my um, uh, presentation, like Charlton, but I'll explain it in a bit. So I'm going to walk through the history a bit of atomic swaps because I want to identify the bits and pieces that have stayed the same to identify how these protocols are designed and to see which limitations they all share. So the two row in my, um, uh, the true row here refers to how many, much on-chain knowledge you need. So the first one that we'll be looking at is HTLC-based atomic swaps. Um, so these are going to be UTXO-based transaction structures and that's the standard uh, atomic swaps that we've known for many years. Um, before um, Hash uh, wrote the, um, his atomic swap paper for doing Bitcoin to Monero. Then that's the next one that we're going to speak with um, about, you can also speak with the protocol, um, uh, the Farcaster protocol, where, um, which uses adaptive signatures instead. And I'm also going to later show like what this looks like with Taproot. And then the very last one, which is uh, nascent protocols that I'm um, following with curiosity, are the ones that require zero on-chain logic. So ones that um, rely on time lock puzzles. Okay, so first, um, let's start with atomic swaps. Who here doesn't know what an atomic swap is? Good. All very knowledgeable people. Okay. <laughs> so the basis of it is that atomic swaps allow us to like trade with our adversaries. Uh, we don't require trust in the in this case, and it's the atomic part is from the guarantee that either if the trade succeeds, both receive the counterparty's funds, or if it does not succeed, then everything's refunded. Now, all of the, what all of these protocols share um, is that this relies on liveness assumption, but we'll look at that in detail when we look at these protocols. And let me first do like one, um, um, well, start like just for context for anyone who comes from another um, environment like Ethereum. Bridges or swaps, both of them allow you to change assets across different chains. Um, when should you choose one and when should you choose the other? So what bridges do is that they wrap assets from one chain and uh, onto the other one. So you're not trading the native assets, but you use some wrapped representation. This has a few shortcomings, but the upside of this is that you retain, if you want this, that you retain the financial exposure to the originating asset, which is not the case with atomic swaps where you're actually exchanging these tokens. So sometimes you may want that. Of course, that's modular the security assumptions about this bridge. Um, but that, that is something that's clear about bridges. You're not exchanging these native tokens. And then with a bridge, the bridge becomes this centralized counterparty. I'm using that very loosely here. It's just one counterparty you go to. And that's also a strength uh, like with atomics, uh, with bridges because you don't have to find a counterparty for doing your atomic, like, like you have to with atomic swaps. Um, and for interoperability, I call that it just an engineering challenge here. Of course, that's not the case. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more interoperability than just transferring NFTs and ERC-20s across the chain, um, but that's the state with them. And uh, as you can read from, like, uh, well, as you can see from, like, we described about bridges, the advantage that um, uh, atomic swaps have, if you want that, is that you're actually exchanging the native tokens. So after the trade is done, you don't need to care about your originating chain anymore, modulo, like a deep reorg or mining attack. Um, the disadvantage is that there's no central counterparty or <laughs> depends how you spin it. It's just harder than to find somebody to trade with. And this is a step that you have to go through to do so. And then interoperability beyond just like doing an asset transfer, that's still in research. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, there, there's one thing that I mentioned there with the more granular attack surface. Um, with atomic swaps, um, well, with bridges, as you can see, like with all of these hacks that happened with Solana and Ethereum, etc. The honeypot is large for doing these things. Whereas if you like hack atomic swaps, then you're going to be breaking much smaller swaps than just like a, usually like a $500 million honeypot. Okay, so that's just for like the overall context. So I'm going to jump into uh, HTLC based swaps now. That's the two row, so the two on chain logics, because both of the chains require on chain logic functionality. Specifically, what we need on both sides in this case is something like a multi sig, and we also need time locks. And what I'll be using to draw the comparison to the later protocols is I'll be consistently using the same colors. So print them into your brain um, for the different parts, uh, moving parts here. So for the secret parts that we're exchanging in this atomic swap, I'll always be using a blue uh, cyan over here. Um, and then for the part that is known in advance, that is uh, public essentially, I'll be using orange. And then for the time locks, I'll be using red. 
So we, we have like um, um, a diagram that shows an atomic swap between the different chains, like chain N and chain B, say Bitcoin and Litecoin, uh, where this would be possible. And that's like one of the original examples of it. And what we're going to have is that one side is going to lock first. That's um, going to be the same, like in all these atomic swaps, you don't lock it at the same time. One side always moves first. And what um, party A, in this case, we're going to call them here um, Elise, um, is going to do um, is that um, Elise will lock these things. Wait, let me quickly just see if I'm actually consistent here. If that's chain A. Yes. Um, so Elise here is going to cook up some pre, uh, some pre image, like some, some private number X, and um, they're going to lock the money here where either both of the parties sign or. Um, some Bob together with knowledge of this pre-image can sign. So if Bob, uh, if somebody can reveal the pre-image for spending this money, um, and they also happen to know like Bob's private key, which in this hopefully is only Bob, then they can spend this transaction one. And then these are the two uh, different um, um, paths that this um, then creates. One is the one where Bob also has to learn what X is, um, and then Bob can send that to himself. Or uh, you have Alice and Bob both sign, which they do in advance, um, but this one is also time locked. That's the T2 over here. And importantly, T2 is going to be larger than the T1. We see like a very similar structure happening on chain B here. That it, it almost looks like, yeah, it looks identical here, just that we have the name switched here. Um, Bob, in this case, will also be locking with his X. The important part here is going to be that only Alice in the, uh, in the beginning knows what X is, not Bob. Um, so, but he'll he'll find ways to find this out later. He's a uh, fairly like, a, well, no, he's not that smart. Anyway, um, so what we're going to do is that first this transaction is going to be created, then this transaction is going to be created, and then we're going to get to the honeypot phase. I'll show that with a success path here. So this is an example of, an, um, um, of a successful atomic swap. So what first, uh, as I described before, is what um, Elise does is that she first creates this X and she signs transaction one and transaction two already. She sends transaction two to Bob so he can sign it in advance. She needs that signature to know that she can, ref uh, like she can refund herself in case the uh, swap goes awry. And then she, uh, he sends the signature back. Once she has the signature and she has faith that in case Bob stops cooperating, uh, the big spiel about these um, swaps is to ensure that even if your counterparty stops cooperating, you can still refund your money. Um, once she receives that signature, oops, Allah, pardon, uh, she can broadcast this transaction one that locks her own money. Then once Bob sees this thing being mined and being finalized, he creates transaction, or in the meantime, he can create transaction three and transaction four, and he sends transaction four for Alice to sign. Once he's received the signature, he's also safe that he knows that he can refund his uh, coins in case Elise um, dies or she goes on a like weekend bender and won't be responding anymore. And then uh, once he receives that signature, he broadcasts transaction three and sends that back over to Elise. Now what Elise does is that she uses this, um, now Bob, as um, I showed here before when looking at this diagram over here, Bob has used the same pre-image that he doesn't know this X here to lock the funds. Now Bob does this for a very good reason, which is like to honeypot Elise into spending this transaction because once Bob spends this transactions, uh, this transaction, uh, Elise will learn, uh, Oh, sorry, once um, Elise spends this transaction, then Bob will learn what X is, which is exactly what happens uh, on the diagram here. Apologies for hopping back and round. Um, so once Elise sees that this transaction three um, uh, like exists there, she can just spend it. So she reveals this um, and she first checks that it's finalized. Then she uses X to like spend that output and that leaks this uh, secret X um, on chain. And then once uh, Bob learns that from on chain, he can spend this um, to himself. And in this case, Hulu, uh, the uh, atomic swap is complete. Let's look at the failure path that we can have in here, um, which is one where one of the sides stops uh, responding. In this case, let, so we wait for T1. So Bob's created the transaction, he's broadcasted it. Elise is on a weekend bender, she's still recovering, she hasn't done anything. And then after like all this servers, like Bob is screw it, he can just spend his transaction four after this timeout because he received the signature from Elise in advance. Um, as you can see here, that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, Bob only broadcasts this transaction that locks his own money after he's already received the signature from Elise. So that's, uh, that's in case um, Elise goes on the weekend bender. What if Bob goes on the weekend bender? Well, Bob can do the same thing. Um, uh, well, in this case, uh, Bob just waits. Um, 
uh, sorry, like um, in this case, uh, Lise sends back the signature for transaction four. Bob doesn't do anything with it. And Lise goes, well, whatever. And she waits for the timeout two and she broadcasts and refunds for, to herself. Now, there's a, the non-atomic, so those are all the three, like, I guess, the, well, the happy paths that you can go through with this. The, um, there's a path also where you can get your, uh, well, you can get the counterparty's funds as well, which is namely, if you look back at what the success path is, after Elise spends, uh, after Elise um, spends transaction three, Bob still has to spend her coins. And if Bob does this after timeout two, or well, it, like waits until timeout two passes, so namely this one over here, Elise can also refund her own money back to herself. So in this case, Elise has back her original, in this case, Bitcoin, and um, well, her original Litecoin, and she also gets Bob's Bitcoin. So Bob shouldn't wait too long for doing this. Now, this, um, um, this, um, um, uh, I'm struggling for words. Uh, this um, beauty defect of the protocol is something like actually in the Farcaster protocol, we make it as an explicit feature. Um, that's the next part. Now we go to the one, Monero. Um, like the one on-chain logics that's required. And that's what we do in the Farcaster protocol. So again, like as I mentioned, I'm using the same colors as before to highlight the parts that are first private and the ones that are public. Um, and um, in the in the case of like the um, uh, Farcaster protocol, we'll be doing this, we can't, uh, we can't be using this pre-image on-chain because we don't have the functionality um, for that in Monero. So we'll be using adapter signatures instead. And there's a lot that goes around, uh, around in the background of these um, adapter signatures, but um, let me just uh, walk you through like the, um, 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 to give you an intuition over here, what we have initially is that we have some public adapter that we first use to like create a signature, but the signature is also encrypted. And from this, then we get an adapter signature um, where there's the private part that we have to plug into decrypt it to get out the real signature. So what we'll have is that we'll first share these adapter signatures um, and then the other party must um, use their uh, private adapter to decrypt it and get the real signature. And then once they use the signature on chain, the other side, since they then both know the adapter signature um, and the signature, they can from that extract this private adapter. So this private adapter here will um, fill the same role as the uh, X that we created here. That's why I'm using the same color for them. And as before, like when we ex do the, uh, as we would do with HLCs, when we validate these transactions, when they're sharing them, we can first validate whether or not this uh, adapter signature is valid and um, yeah, and, we, and whether the signature like eventually is valid too. And it won't be uh, this, I mean, this transaction, the signature will be useless if it's not a valid one. Okay, so so much for the adapter signatures. Uh, I'll walk over into like what's, uh, Farcast, how Farcaster differs from the HLC protocols. So Farcaster is like an asymmetric protocol. So the, uh, the different blockchains are gonna have different roles. We eventually settled for um, uh, different um, uh, nomenclature here, and uh, uh, thanks to Charlatan and uh, both Kayaba, like uh, their involvement in like finding new like terms for these. Um, so we use the arbitrating for the side that does the on-chain logic, and then the accordance side for the one that follows what happens on-chain of uh, like that follows the protocol as it's set by the other side. So in this example, we would be using Bitcoin, say, on the arbitrating side, and Monero would be on the accordance side. That's also why I chose orange and red here to represent them. So on the one blockchain, we need a couple of functionalities. We need time locks, we need scripts, and we need either in Bitcoin's case, SegWit or something equivalent um, here for the UTX O-based swaps. Now, um, and then the other side doesn't need any requirements beyond spending. Now, these um, requirements that I spend up here are of course very specific to um, uh, doing something on UTX O-based one, but then there's, uh, you can also do this in Ethereum with an account-based one, and I recommend to you to check out Elizabeth's um, project there for um, atomic swaps, who we also presented earlier. So if you haven't seen her presentation, please check it out, it's cool. Okay, so um, what we're also going to do on the Monero side is that we're gonna create like a two of two multi-sig on the accordant chain. It's not really like a multi-sig, it's actually like a sharded private key. So initially, this private key that we have, Alice will know one part and oops, Allah, what is that? That should have been a B. I'm sorry about that. So it's not Alice and Alice herself. That would be a very unfair protocol, but this, is, this should be underscore B. <laughs> 
oops, let's check the code and whether we have implemented like this, that would not be very good. <laughs> So what you do to get the actual public key that you're using is that you're going to be adding up uh, both Alice's and Bob's uh, private keys and those are together again a valid um, a private key and then likewise the um, um, the public representation of that the, the the group point is also going to be valid if you add them like that. So the signing key uh, of their the sum of their private keys is going to uh, correspond to the sum of their public keys. Okay and Unlike with uh, the HLC-based swaps, where we just have some arbitrary secrets, we're going to be exchanging these private keys in, in, inside these adapter signatures. So you could think of it as, as selling your private key to the other side so they can spend the funds. So we have a couple of problems that um, arise when we don't, um, when we have one side of the, um, the swap that doesn't have uh, many fancy features, uh, like. Minera in this case, where we can just see the transactions. So, firstly, how do we ensure that like like a share is always revealed? And um, that's that's the part we need this because we don't have time locks there on Minera, or they've been deprecated. And uh, what if the arbitrating the accordant um, um, chains are in different elliptic curves, um, as is the case, for instance, for Bitcoin and Minera? Um, so in one case we have SecP, in the other one uh, we have Curve uh, 25519. So the first one we can solve by always revealing. And we introduce a punish path for that. To, so if the counterparty doesn't respond, so if at least, or, um, so in this case only Bob, Bob can be punished, which is similar to how in the HTLC based swaps, what I mentioned with the implicit punish path in case, um, uh, in that case, uh, at least would go on a bender. Um, um, now it just flips that now the roles are Bob. So in this case, if Bob doesn't respond after some time and Elise can't redeem her own funds because she never learns Bob's private key to redeem her, um, refund her Monero, then she can simply take Bob's Bitcoin. So that's the key insight that allows the atomic swaps. And then the other part for doing this across different curves is to use a discrete logger quality proof. And what we're going to do there is we're going to have a representation of a private key that lives both on one curve, on the one curve and the one on the other. So in this case, SecP and um, um, curve 25519. And we're going to prove that these two public keys are equivalent and share the same um, discrete log. Um, so that's what I show over here. So in this case, that would be um, T would be the representation on a sec P, so Bitcoin, and then K is on curve 2509, so Monero. So we're going to prove the equivalence. Um, I go into a bit more detail here. This is from the this is the protocol suggested by MRL10, uh, so from Sarang. Um, and uh, in this case, what we're going to do to allow this to happen for cur uh, like uh, groups that they have different sizes is that we do like Peterson commitments to every bit of the private key. Then we create ring signatures uh, on every bit to show that it is indeed a bit, so either zero or one, and that um, that these uh, that each index of this private key uh, the value is the same across both groups. And then we also need a proof of knowledge to ensure that this X over here is not just another commitment. An alternative approach that's used by the commit protocol is uh, Sigma protocols. Um, I wanted to actually show how these daily queues work, but then when I explained it to somebody, I looked at the time and it's uh, 40 minutes had passed and that doesn't fit into this presentation, so I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so from this, um, from these bits and pieces, we can now start constructing what the on-chain logic on the Bitcoin side actually looks like. So this will look quite different from, well, yeah, quite different. Well, we add this punish path. There are a lot of shared pieces that we have between the HTLC based swaps and these ones, but there's a lot that differs too. So there's an optional funding transaction. That's that's a software detail. I went, um, well, go into that. But uh, the important part that sh stays the same here from the HTLC based swaps is this locking transaction, which is the instantiation as this is the TX1 from the um, HTLC based swaps that we saw earlier. And then once you have this lock, you have the happy path where in the meantime, um, the Bob gives um, Alice his uh, adapter signature and then she can use, uh, well, she, she uses that to sign and um, uh, incidentally then also leak out the key that Bob needs to spend her funds. So that's the happy path, the buy path. Um, and then we also have the cancel path, um, which corresponds to the refund transactions in um, in the HTLC, uh, HTLC case, except for that we also add a punish path here in case Bob becomes uh, irresponsive on his weekend bender. Um, here's some, I do have to monitor the time a bit because I do have a flight at 
uh, quarter past six, so I <laughs> will. <laughs> so apologies if I skip through some details. I would like to sleep uh, in Copenhagen tonight, even though I like uh, Prague a lot. <laughs> um, so I, I'll, I'll show you like this representation here, like what this looks like as a locking script. So um, this over here, this part here of the Bitcoin script is the um, is the happy path. So that's the one that eventually uh, gets spent in this buy over here. And the key part that I want to he highlight to you over here is that we have these adapter signatures. So Alice's adapter key is required to then decrypt Bob's signature. And when she spends this, Bob actually learns her um, her, sh uh, her share of the uh, Monero of the uh, her share of the private key that he can then use to unlock the Monero on the other side. And then the other path over here is the time locked one, similarly as we had in the HTLC based swaps, and that is used in case. Um, uh, they don't want to do the swap anymore. Um, here again in detail, this is the buy path. So once Alice inserts it over here, she uses the the adapter signature from uh, like from Bob, and on the cancel path, that is just spent by both of the straight up signatures, but that's only spendable after some timeout has passed. And then once we go to the cancel stage, so if you just look at these indices here, that's number three. I'll jump back here. That's this here. So this will show us what these two um, transactions here look like. So that, that's what the purpose of this slide here. So the first path is the one that is the not super happy path, but mediocre map path, which is the uh, which is the um, normal cancel. Uh, and in this case, you just need a multi-sig from both. Um, but in this case, again, as on the slide before, in this case, we have Bob's adapter key that he then uses so that when Bob spends this transaction back to himself, Alice will learn his uh, private key share um, that she can use to refund her Monero. And then the super unhappy path, because the Monero stay locked, uh, is that Alice has to punish Bob. And this is, yeah, um, non-consensually in this case. And um, in this case, the Monero will stay locked unless the two parties find a secondary outside protocol for coming to an agreement how to uh, refund them thereafter. And this is just um, spelling out in detail once you plug everything in. Okay, so once we've done that, uh, we actually follow this protocol, what we do before we do the swap. So first we initialize these keys and exchange the public representations of them. We share the discrete log quality proofs on both sides to uh, prove to the counterparty that uh, the private key we're going to give them is either going to be used to claim our Monero or refund their Bitcoin or vice versa. And we also have to share the private Monero review keys so we can see whether or not the funds have actually, uh, whether or not Alice is funded. Then thereafter, we create the Bitcoin transactions and they're co-signed by both parties and they share uh, and, um, and they share them with one another so that they have these signatures. And then you prepare the adapter signatures where Alice uh, already shares her adapter signature for the refund with Bob, which was the trend, this one over here, which then again which uses Bob's adapter key where he then leaks his private key. Okay. So we plug that in over here. So uh, everything I showed on this prior diagram, I'll switch back to it, is the step that happens before Bob funds. Once Bob funds, he locks. Uh, if uh, Alice locks his ball, then uh, Bob will share his um, um, his signature with her, um, his adapter signature, and uh, Alice um, uses that then to go down the buy path and leaks the private key to Bob so he can spend her coins. And if we go down the timeout path, then none of that happens. Then one of the parties um, initially it's cancelled with both of them have the signatures for from the counterparty otherwise they wouldn't be doing the swap and then either we do the refund where Bob leaks his pri private key to Alice so she can also refund her Monero or if um, the, the second time it passes Alice just punishes him and takes his Bitcoin and the Monero stay locked. We can also do this on uh, Taproot for greater privacy, so we don't have to reveal the script. Again, I'm <laughs> slightly short on time here. Um, I, I will just say that what we can do with um, Taproot is that we can hide all of this uh, like in a Merkleized form where we don't have to reveal either the cancel or the buy scripts in advance. And if we both come to agreement, we don't even, when executing one of them, we can just agree to agree and don't even have to reveal either of these scripts. So this allows for much more private swaps where then on chain, this will just look like a normal transaction. Whereas right now, um, our structure um, over here has a distinct finger, well, has a fingerprint that is not as private as we would like it to be. And these are some details, like what the um, tap scripts look like. Let's skip those. I want to catch the flight. 
let's jump over to the last stage, the zero, so the zero on-chain logic requirement, which um, uses time lock puzzles. So these time locks here, which we like on Monero, we can actually simulate with time lock puzzles. What you typically do in this case is that you, um, like with like uh, verifiable timed commitments, is that you have some process that is inherently sequential. So for instance, you could be do, like doing squarings, like modular some other number, that you just have to do one after the other. So we can get like a deterministic computational effort that is required here, unless somebody does an optimization in here, that uh, will simulate the role that the time locks had before in both the HTLC-based swaps or in the Bitcoin swaps. Now, this still has a problem. You receive a time lock puzzle that is uh, that you can like hack away. It's like essentially like mining like away at it, and eventually you get something out. But you don't know that this value that you get out is actually something that you want, which is uh, not a nice situation to be in. Uh, you expect a cow and you get a dog. Um, um, right. So we have to verify that this concealed value is actually the one that we want, which is this private key value x. And an approach that we can use for this is a cut and choose protocol, which I, uh, I really like cut and choose protocols. So the structure here is that what we'll do is that Bob will, um, um, Bob will shard his, um, Bob just shard his secret or like the signature. So in this case, the, actually the signature is the part that's secret that will be shared here. Um, you cut it up and he gives, Elise can choose, um, so he, um, uh, um, he hides shards of this, in this case, via Lagrange interpolation, he hides shards of his um, secret um, in a couple of little boxes, and he allows Alice to open up a few of these boxes, and then she always, uh, and then she always like, uh, knocks that time lock puzzle for her, and she can check if what is inside that box is what she expected. And she goes, aha, 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 these are all good. And then she does sufficient of these that she has confidence that all the other boxes are still uh, also uh, have been validly done. So if all of these ones have been valid, you can build the protocol in such a way that the chance that um, Bob has done all of these ones that Alice chose correctly and not the, um, uh, and has done as um, um, uh, just put garbage in the box that she hasn't opened, you can make that diminishingly small. That's the design of these protocols. In this case, it here it happens with a Lagrange interpolation where Beach and op uh, then she opens up uh, T minus one of these puzzles and then um, uh, sh uh, once she's done that, she'll have high confidence that at least one of the unopened boxes, uh, puzzles that she had, is valid, and that will be sufficient for her to, via this Lagrange interpolation, reconstruct sigma, so the signature here that she needs to spend the coins. And if she does that, she accepts the proof, and you do this vice versa for Alice's boxes with Bob. You can refine this um, as well, because um, all these time lock puzzles that Alice has to open, uh, each one of them have like some, um, like a hardness T that's just like a parameter for um, quantifying that. And she could be doing this in parallel, but if she doesn't do that, um, it, we can also um, uh, package this up into a non-interactive uh, zero knowledge proof, like first by the Shia uh, um, transform. And then we can replace this that she can do, uh, open up all of these boxes uh, within the same hardness T. Um, that's, uh, which makes this much more, uh, which makes this much fairer towards like, um, uh, so that somebody who has like a lot of computing power that they can paralyze doesn't have an unfair advantage on the other side. And then um, we replace the time locks that we had in the HTLC based swaps with these time lock puzzles. So what you see here in the setup phase is that you first create these time lock puzzles for the refund transactions, which can then be spent in case we had a timeout. And then once you've shared these, you do the locking. And here, if you follow this, um, the structure here is like the party, so P0 is party zero and P1 is party one. And the first one in each uh, quadrant over here is the one that first does this action and the other one is after them uh, temporarily. Uh, temporarily. Um, and then, so after they set up these things where they create these time lock puzzles, then party one, in this case, uh, say Elise, uh, uh, locks first and then Bob locks and they can do this safely now because they know that they have these time lock puzzles after which they can refund their own coins in case they don't come to an agreement. And then in the uh, stage, so after they do the locking, we go to the completion phase and here we can do a variety of things. Like for instance, we can use adapter signatures again where we first create transactions where there's an adapter signature that leaks out the private key that we need to spend the counterparty's um, funds. And then in case this doesn't happen at some stage, we, um, we can unlock our own money uh, um, uh, again from these time lock puzzles. Uh, and again over here, so the party that um, locked first can also unlock first, and the party that locked second can also uh, only unlock after them. 
Okay, we actually did pretty good on time. Thank you that you don't want to see me in uh, uh, Prague again for <laughs> tonight. I can actually probably make it. Um, yeah, so let me just go, th the last bit that I'll say here is like the issues that we have with um, atomic swaps. So the issue that, the, the primary issue that I have is this free option problem, which is that one side has to lock first. We can't really get around that. And in this case, if I lock my funds, uh, if, well, um, if you lock your funds first, and um, I can then look at the exchange rate in the meantime before I do uh, lock my own funds, um, um, and then if, they, if the exchange rate um, moves against me, then I simply choose to not participate in this, and then you lose out on the uh, transaction fees. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so this problem here, like all of these atomic swap protocols share, and the other one which I've um, tried to highlight as a common um, theme between all of them is that the atomicity is only guaranteed if you remain live. So in the HLC case, if you wait for timeout T2, or in the HLC case, if the party that locks first waits for the second timeout, uh, uh, sorry, if the party that locks second waits for the timeout, then the counterparty can take their funds and uh, also refund their own. And in the uh, Farcaster protocol, if uh, Bob sleeps too long, then Alice punishes him, and the Monero stay locked. And like, uh, likewise with the um, um, uh, time lock puzzles, if, uh, say, P0 spends the funds from the counterparty and P1 doesn't do this, then P0 just waits for T0 to pass and can refund their own uh, coins. So they all share this issue that they are not atomic if you don't remain live. And then with time lock puzzles, they're... Uh, is a bit that makes me a bit uncomfortable in this Islamic tube, but um, um, which is that the this temporal security that you have over here depends highly on the assumptions of your powerful adver uh, like on like a powerful adversary. So you um, you can do in best case you will say like well I assume that the computational effort you'll use the you'll use the fastest single core processor that you have in uh, like that you're aware of to set like these time bounds but it may be that somebody has some super fancy schmancy processor that is hidden away from public sites that can do these things much faster and then this teaser that you see over here may come to pass much earlier than you would like and now you're poor um, so don't trade with intel or well i i guess arm or uh, apple is catching up for much faster on um, like a single core processing um, time yep um, that's it. I have time for some Q&A. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>